these data, these surveys are part of uh, an air, a project known as the Air Barometer Survey Project. Uh, we've been doing this for about 15 years, and I'm one of the people who helps to lead it along with people in the region and a couple other people in the US. Um, and so uh, I do want to introduce you to the barometer itself. Uh, it's, it's, there's a lot of information there that's readily available that people might be interested in, uh, and I will do that a, a little later. Um, and along the way, I'll be talking about different kinds of projects and um, give you a sense of, of kind of the kinds of questions that we investigate. I put this <coughs> little notice up here, just uh, a little attempt at humor, that um, you know, people would ask, can you actually do research here? Uh, and yes, these are the topics to avoid. And of course, they're the most interesting topics and they're exactly the topics that we are investigating. So there's a little wink over here on, on the eye. <coughs> um, I'm gonna start with uh, a, uh, a piece of research that we did that, uh, hang on. Okay, uh, that we did uh, in the wake of the Arab Spring and I'll tell you a little bit about it. Uh, and this is just to give you a sense of some of the things that we, some of the kinds of questions we, that we can investigate uh, and some of the kinds of conclusions that we were able to draw or at least that we're able to, to highlight. Um, sorry, I'm kind of... So uh, this, is, this is Tunisia and uh, Egypt uh, starting in 2011. Uh, you probably know that uh, 2011 was the critical year for the Arab Spring. And these two countries were the ones in which the old regime, uh, very much disliked by the population, uh, a lot of corruption, a lot of authoritarianism, or at least a fair amount. Uh, and those regimes were toppled by the, by the, the, the men and women that came into the streets. Uh, in Tunisia, it was done at the end of uh, uh, 2010, uh, and then the changes really took place in 2011. So we did a survey in, um, uh, in each of the countries. Uh, you'll see when I get to the part about the barometer itself that there are different waves and there are different time periods during which we, uh, we conduct sur surveys. This is actually the second one, uh, 2011. Uh, we, we, we did a first, survey, sur first wave of surveys in 2006 to 2009. Um, and you'll see what that means later. Uh, and so we asked a couple of questions. Uh, one was, uh, how much confidence do you have or not have in um, the major Islamic party? Uh, in Tunisia, it's the Nafta, uh, the Renaissance Party, and in um, Egypt, it's the Freedom and Justice Party, the party of the Ikhwan or of the, the Muslim Brotherhood. So these are mainstream Islamist parties. Uh, they're not necessarily on the fringes. They're, uh, they're participating fully in the political process. Uh, there's some, some, some dispute about whether they played much of a role in the demonstrations that brought down the old regime. Uh, but anyway, there are parties with, with, the, with, with which uh, people in each country have been, uh, uh, have been aware for a long time. So I asked them, how much trust do you have or how much confidence? Uh, and we can see that um, about half of the population um, says uh, yes. Um, um, I mean, half says yes, half says no. Uh, we do have confidence in this. So the party isn't particularly marginalized. It's a mainstream party, and about half the population has, uh, has trust in it. It's about the same thing down here in Egypt. Uh, we can see 47% do have trust, uh, 53 don't or have much less trust. Uh, but it's, uh, so we can, we can get a sense of how wide support for the party is. Uh, and this is on the eve of elections. There are gonna be elections uh, within a few months of, of doing the survey, uh, and we will find out that each of these parties were victorious in the election uh, and presumably won in large part by, from, with the votes that they, that they got from the people who have trust in them. But we also asked a second question. <clears throat> um, do you agree that religious leaders should have influence over government decisions? This is actually one question in a battery of questions. I just picked out one because I think it's kind of representative of the group, but we have a, a number of different questions about uh, how, to what extent they want the country to be guided by Islamic law, Islamic authorities. Uh, and so one question is relig religious leaders should have influence over government decisions. What's notable, <coughs> I'm typing a drink of water if you can't see me. What's notable is the people who want an Islamist sensibility in government uh, Islamic religious leaders should have importance, or Islamic uh, code should be respected. 
That's only about a quarter of the percentage in, in Tunisia, only half of the people who have trust. Uh, the figures are a little bit less dramatic in Egypt, but still the number of people who support uh, an Islamist agenda, the platform on which these parties uh, campaign, uh, significantly less than the people that trust. So we see there are a fair number of people who don't particularly support an Islamist agenda, and yet they're voting for the Islamist party. So we're asking the question, why did people vote for a party with which they did not, do not agree? Uh, we can talk about that in Q&A if you want. I think that's, uh, that's, I think we have some answers to that question, <clears throat> but it's, uh, it's an important question. So uh, right away we see that there's a gap between um, people who have something positive to say about the party and whether or not they actually agree with the party's platform. They're supporting it for other reasons. <clears throat> okay, so now um, the, uh, the Enafta and um, the Freedom and Justice Party won their elections in Egypt and Tunisia. And uh, we now came back, we did the third wave of our surveys. The previous one was the second wave. <clears throat> and uh, we asked our questions again. Um, so uh, religious leaders should have influence over government decisions. And this was done in 2013, after these parties had been in power for roughly a year and a half. Uh, they, they actually took power a little bit later in Egypt. But uh, <clears throat> so we see that uh, we can see what was the impact of a year of, of uh, living for a year under a government run by this Islamist party with this platform that many people agree with, but a significant number who voted that party don't agree with. Uh, and what we see is uh, there were important differences. So the percentage of people who uh, uh, strongly, disagree, strongly disagree in Egypt here in 2011, now it's much higher. So many more people uh, have lost trust in the party or do not agree with this, this Islamist platform. Uh, and, uh, and so we can say that uh, something changed during the period the Islamists were in power, that the Ikhwan was in power. Uh, I'll say a word about that in a minute. Uh, in Tunisia, a, a similar story. It's not quite the same in that uh, the number of people who agree with the platform 26 before, 26 after, didn't change. But among those who don't agree, they've moved from uh, primarily somewhat disagree to now very strongly disagree. So uh, the, the country has become more polarized a, as a result. Uh, it's, so it's worth, uh, I mean, if we're interested in these countries, it's worth asking, so what accounts for these changes? Why has there been uh, diminution in support for political Islam uh, or uh, an intensification of that opposition <coughs> as in, in Tunisia? Uh, if you go there and talk to people at the time, which I was fortunately able to do, uh, there will be people who do not support the party and they will say they just, they behave terribly. They pass uh, their political appointments, the judges they put in power, uh, some of their laws, it was just terrible. But if you ask people who supported the party, you'll get a different story. Uh, and they will tell you, you know, the old regime was still around. They sabotaged this. Uh, the example they give in Egypt is that uh, if, um, uh, if, you, if you remember, there were, uh, during the time the Islamists were in power, that year that, uh, that passed here, uh, there were long lines for getting gasoline and products were in short supply. Uh, and uh, just another indication of why this, why this Islamist government is, uh, uh, is incompetent. But miraculously, once that party left power, all of a sudden, all the gas you could want is available. There were no shortages. Uh, and so the argument is that uh, th there has been a change, but it hasn't necessarily told us something about uh, what an Islamist party does when it's in power. It might tell us that. There are people who insist it does tell us that, but it might be uh, this sabotage by the old regime. So <clears throat> this gets us into a lot of interesting questions about what's going on. We can get some, some insights in terms of uh, what happened in the aftermath of the Arab Spring and what are some of the things that, uh, that might account for it. So I have, one more, I have one more slide on this, and then I'm going to start with the Arab barometer a little bit. Um, and so these, were, these, these are the two countries that really exemplified the Arab Spring. The old regime fell. Uh, there were free and fair elections. Uh, the Islamists came to power in those elections. Uh, so these are the, these are the countries that, that typify most. Uh, there were, the regimes did fall in other countries, in Libya, in, in Yemen, uh, almost in Bahrain, but not quite. Uh, so there, there are other countries, but these two are particularly important. So the question I want to ask, and this, is, this takes us to the next slide in a minute, 
do you think that other countries in the neighborhood, maybe Algeria right next door, uh, maybe Jordan, uh, now they didn't, they didn't live under an Islamist government for a year and a half. So they didn't have exactly the same experience, uh, but they were right next door. They were following events and um, probably, this is, a, this is a question, I don't mean to, to answer it, probably uh, they were influenced by the developments, by developments in these two countries, especially these two very important countries, these exemplars of the, <coughs> of the Arab Spring. Uh, so we're going to look at, the other, at some other countries now, uh, and we're going to compare the other countries, 2011 and 2013, and we're asking, has support for political Islam declined in those, uh, in those, in those other countries, the countries that observed it or witnessed it but didn't experience it? Uh, and this brings up questions about diffusion. Uh, so here's the next slide, and the answer will be clear. Uh, no. Uh, there is a lot of variation in terms of the countries, Iraq, Palestine, uh, Jordan, and Algeria. They don't look very much like one another, but in each of the countries, the pattern in 2013 is very similar to the pattern in 2011. So it doesn't seem, kind of surprisingly, because there's a lot of discussion about, <coughs> about diffusion uh, and what happens in one country uh, influences how people think about things in another country, and that country then has some re reaction to that. Uh, and there may be important areas where there still is diffusion, but at least in terms of the question that we're asking here, uh, we've observed what impact uh, a year and a half under an Islamist government made in terms of the views of ordinary citizens about the role that Islam should play in political affairs. Uh, and we see that in those countries, there was a shift away from support. But in, the other, in these other countries nearby, uh, no real change. What, what we see in 2013 looks very much like what we see in 2011. And so that's a contribution to this diffusion debate or this diff diffusion scenario uh, that is, uh, is floating around. <clears throat> okay, so this is one example. I've got uh, a number of little stories like this and we'll see how much, how much time we have to go through them. But I, but I put these up front just to give you a sense of one example of the kinds of things, kinds of questions the data enable us to ask, uh, and that we try to have, we try to have the data tell us something instructive. Uh, okay, so now is the error barometer, uh, and here are the uh, the basic statistics. When we get to questions, uh, if you want to ask more about the barometer, <coughs> that would be fine. Uh, you can see the countries we're in. Some countries have only been able to do it once. Um, we, uh, I mean, in many cases, there's a story behind each country. We, I, I'll tell you just one quick story. We were starting, we were about a third of the way done with our survey in Saudi Arabia in the most recent wave. And um, we were funding surveys in the Gulf uh, with, uh, with, with funds from a grant that we received, a uh, uh, successful proposal to the Qatar National Research Foundation. Uh, and we, did, we used this for Kuwait, we used this for Qatar, we were using it for Saudi Arabia. Then in the middle of that, there was a blockade. Those of you who know the region may, may be aware of this. <coughs> um, uh, Saudi Arabia and the Emirates instituted, and they brought Bahrain along, uh, instituted a blockade against, uh, against Qatar. And so it was impossible to use Qatari money to study Saudi Arabia. Qataris would be unhappy about that. And the Saudis would say, so you've, so you've got, the Qataris are now spying on us? So, and there are, I mean, you'll see gaps here and there. What happened in Morocco in this second wave? Um, so I, I know most of these stories, but, uh, but it's still a pretty good coverage. And for, I think, six or seven countries, uh, we have them in all the waves. So first wave is, uh, here it is over here, 2006 to 2009. Uh, we can just follow it right through. Uh, Lebanon, the same thing. Uh, Palestine, the same thing. Uh, and Egypt and Tunisia, we couldn't do surveys in those countries uh, under the old regime. Uh, it was a very authoritarian context, and one, we wouldn't have authorization, and two, uh, people would probably be very hesitant to, to speak to us. So for Egypt and Tunisia, these countries I was talking about before, we only begin at the second wave, which is 2010-2011. Uh, but we've got pretty good coverage, and uh, you'll see sometimes we can look at change over time. Uh, so there are five waves. These are just some, some raw statistics. 
Um, I'll say a bit about the methods a little later, but I won't talk in too much about it unless you, unless you want to ask questions. Uh, but, but uh, well, anyway, that's, that's what it looks like. Okay. Uh, I do want to say down here, the, uh, the data are publicly available and they, you can have them in any one of several formats. Uh, you just go to the, uh, to the website. I'll show you where that is in a little bit. Go to the website and you can download whatever you want. Uh, Saudi data from 2011 or the Tunisian data from uh, 2016 uh, or all of them. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's a public service and we know, well, it's gonna come up in another slide. Um, so I'll, I'll say it when I get to it. But uh, the website, there's a lot of traffic to the website. If you want to know, well, what exactly do you, what are the questions you study? Here's kind of a list. Uh, again, uh, gender, uh, politics, religion, uh, exactly the things that are, that are controversial and that's what makes the data valuable. Here's the steering committee. Um, so Mani and me, uh, Mani is, is a professor at Princeton, but she was our student here at, uh, at Michigan when she was a graduate student. And then, uh, well, I mean, you can see the names. I, I, I know every one of them, and if you want to ask about any of them, I'll, I'll tell you who they are. They're all, they're all good people. Um, oh, yes, I wanted to say something about the picture up here. Uh, people sometimes ask, well, where do these questions come from? Why did you ask this question? Uh, that's a reasonable thing for people to ask us. And the answer is, uh, we have meetings before every wave of our team. Uh, people from not necessarily every country, but most of the countries. Uh, and we spend a day or two uh, arguing about the questionnaire and we all have questions we want to ask. Uh, and what should the wording be? Uh, discussions, uh, sometimes they're sort of half, sometimes they're mostly in Arabic with some, with some English, uh, and sometimes they're mostly in English with some, some Arabic. Uh, but we put together this, this survey instrument uh, or this interview schedule. And uh, this is where it comes from. For now, for each wave, uh, we look at what we looked at the previous wave, and we ask ourselves, uh, were there some things that, did, that needed to be added that didn't get added? Uh, and the answer to that is yes, and I'll tell you what it was in a minute, the most recent one. Um, and uh, there's some questions that didn't work, or some topics that are really no longer important. Uh, and so we begin, we use as a foundation <coughs> the survey instrument from the previous wave, and then we, we revise it and update it and expand it. Uh, and, um, and one of the hardest things about this is trying to cut it down. We usually have a, a bunch of questions and topics that we all agree are important, uh, and it's going to take us an hour and 15 minutes to have an interview with this. So 45 minutes is sort of the maximum, and we feel we have to be under that. So there's a lot of kind of bargaining as well. Someone say, you know, I need this question for my research, or the people in my country are doing this. Uh, this past time, for, for wave number five, uh, we added a question or a battery of questions that hadn't been asked before uh, that I think were very important. And, uh, and I can tell you kind of how we got it, but it has to do with sexual, uh, sexual harassment and intimate partner violence. Uh, very strong battery of questions and, and some very good information. Uh, and, um, and there's a bit of a story in terms of how, how we got to the point where we recognized this is important and started bargaining about what the question should be. Uh, so again, just to give you a feel for the barometer. Um, here's, I won't spend much time on this, but uh, if you wanted more information, you know, where does the funding come from? Uh, who's, a, well, who's administering, you saw before, what's, what's the sampling uh, technique? The one thing I wanna say is that after the first wave, where we maybe weren't able to have every survey be as strong as it should have been, uh, especially a couple of them uh, just alerted us to the need to pay attention. We've developed a, a really strong quality control measure uh, and involves training of interviewers, involves pre-testing the instrument, it has to do with things that we do along the way. Uh, and uh, all I can say is that uh, we're really very proud of it. And we've been working with people who are looking at, at a bunch of other surveys in the region, uh, Pew or Gallup uh, or World Value Survey, and um, Many of them have some work to do to increase their quality control as well. Uh, and I know actually some of them are. Uh, so I just wanna, so here's what's here. If you can, uh, I'll come back to it if anybody wants. Okay, so now I am gonna try to take you to the, uh, to the website. Uh, this is, uh, what this shows is um, what we call an online uh, analysis tool. 
and you can go to the website. And I said, you can go to the website and download the data. Uh, they're free and you use them as you wish. Uh, but if you don't want to download the data, that's more work than you want to undertake, or you don't really have the software, uh, you can do a lot of analysis without downloading the data. And that's our online data analysis tool. Uh, and I want to show you that. Uh, here's some stats about, uh, you know, 100,000 visits a year um, coming from all over, uh, score hundreds of thousands of, down, of downloads of data or the reports. All right, so let me see if I can, I thought I had this set up before, so I'm going to try to get to it. Okay, this should be it. Uh, okay, so now I'm on the website. This comes up, uh, and to get here, it's just airbarometer.org. Uh, one word, airbarometer, two Bs, barometer, uh, .org, and the front page will come up. Uh, I don't think this is actually the front page, but it, it is what come, came up. Uh, so you can look at the topics. You want some of the information that I was saying about uh, who we are, uh, stuff about methodology, stuff about funding. Uh, you can find all of that. Uh, there are a lot of publications here. Uh, some of them aren't exactly publications, but reports. Uh, one of our Mark, if I might jump in, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Oh, Could you oh. make sure uh, you share that screen, the, the uh, website screen? I think you have to redo that. Okay, yeah. We're still seeing your presentation screen. Sure, okay, so give me some guidance on. Uh, so click on the share screen button at the bottom of your Zoom. Um, okay, wait, well, this is, um, a new, it says new share, I guess that would be it. Yeah, and then yeah. you pick the screen that has the, the screen you're looking at. Okay, did it come up? Uh, let's see here. Not yet. I clicked uh, share, and then there's a little another button to press, which I did. did. Yeah, you choose the screen, like a bunch of screens pop up, little uh, menu. Uh, yeah, I don't see a bunch of screens. <coughs> um, or try again the the share screen, the green share screen button. Okay, and then then uh, I okay here I see it. I get I get the point. And you choose it, and then you hit share screen again. There you go. Yeah, I got it. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> okay, so uh, you know, we I was just about to say there's a really good report <clears throat> uh, done by one of our Tunisian partners uh, uh, that analyzes the public the the new data about sexual uh, harassment. That if you want to follow it up, but there's all kinds of stuff on corruption and uh, uh, some interesting things about Lebanon for those of you who've been following what's going on there. Um, okay, so for the online and data analysis, you go to survey data, and here are your choices. Uh, you can go down and you can download the data, as I said, but we're going to go to the online analysis tool. And <clears throat> this is going to start by asking us, uh, so which uh, surveys, which, which time period are you interested in? Uh, in the most recent wave, 2018, 2019? Sure. Uh, which country? Do you want all the countries? Or let's just take Tunisia and specify your countries. And um, then you, next you come down here to, uh, to uh, see results. And this is going to give you the, allow you to pick the topic you want. So um, I'll just pick one that I'll take. Um, and you can search for questions too. I'll take general topics and we'll see what that is. I think I know what some of it is. Um, and uh, oh, inter okay, interpersonal trust. I like that a lot. This is a really important variable, and I'm going to use it in one of the examples that I'll be giving you a little bit, a little bit further down the line. Uh, but it's basically, do you have, do you trust people like yourselves? I mean, you think most people are honest and you can rely on them, or most people will take advantage of you if they can, and you have to be very cautious. Um, so we see, this is, this is uh, Tunisia in uh, 2018, that uh, most people do not have trust. Here's, here's the wording over here. Must be very careful when dealing with people. 91% of the people say that. Uh, that's that's the that's problematic, uh, and only uh, uh, eight percent, uh, eight or nine percent say uh, sure you can trust other people. This is a variable that, that that's important. I, I I may run out of time before I get to the example that that looks at <coughs> at this variable. But uh, one of the ways in which comes it comes up is a lot of discussion about uh, you know what what is needed for for not just the Arab world, but 
for, for a number of countries, including some in the Arab world, uh, to really have a successful transition to democracy. Um, well, some of that has to do with uh, the leaders and, and, and what they're willing to do and maybe what their international supporters help them to do or prevent them from doing. Uh, but there's also an important, uh, an important dimension in terms of the role that the ordinary citizens have to play. Uh, they need to embrace a series of values that are, <clears throat> that are conducive to democracy uh, and include things like tolerance and civic engagement. But as far as trust is concerned, the idea is if you are going to say we need to have democracy because that's when the people get to make decisions. Well, if you think only, if only eight or nine percent of you think the, pe the people are trustworthy, you're going to say, I, the last people I would trust is the people like myself. We need, we need strong leaders to make the decisions for us. So this is a variable that, that in, engages with a number of things in an important way. Uh, and I had forgotten how dramatic this difference is. But uh, you can go back, I won't go back now, but you can go back and uh, uh, see if it's the same in some other countries. Maybe you'll say, I bet it's higher in Palestine. Or, I mean, and, and so you can do a lot of analysis on, on your own here. Okay, so I'm gonna get out of that and hopefully get back to the other. Uh, okay, so now, um, um, you can't see the, uh, okay, so I guess, uh, Ryan, I guess I need to screen share now with this, with this. Yeah, okay. you choose the other screen again, your presentation screen. Yeah, okay, I think I've got it. Okay, is it up? Yep, All right. yep. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit about, about women and gender. Uh, I can see that I won't get through all my examples. So. Uh, as we get close to five o'clock, uh, I'll tell you what some of the things that, that I have slides on that I would show if we had more time, and we can talk about them a little bit in, uh, uh, in the Q&A, if, if you like. <laughs> so uh, here, uh, the basic point is that women matter. This is also something that's important for democratization, that there be a uh, kind of openness to, uh, uh, to, to equal rights for women, uh, along with, along with uh, interpersonal trust and some other things I mentioned like tolerance. Uh, so needless to say, this is an important question here in our own society and everywhere and in the, in the Arab world. I don't know if you've heard about the Arab Human Development Report. Uh, it began, uh, this, was, this was I think the fifth in the series. I think it began around 2000. This one is from 2005. And um, these were done by, uh, under UN auspices, but uh, written and uh, designed and written by uh, prominent scholars from, uh, from the Arab world. Um, they've sometimes wanted some of our data, which we're very happy to share. Uh, and, they've, and they've been talking about the various deficits that uh, need to be overcome. Uh, and there was a deficit of uh, women's empowerment, which was this, this deficit of democracy. Uh, and these are, uh, these are Arab scholars putting out an agenda. Uh, sometimes controversial. Some some people argue they're too closely tied to the West, and these are Western values. And there's room for discussion about uh, exactly what what's relevant here. Uh, but I think it's safe to say putting uh, issues of, of gender and women on the on the agenda is is important. Saba Mahmoud, um, she's an anthropologist. I uh, we I signed one of her books or chapters from one of her books in my class. Um, I can tell you who the other people are, but you get the idea. So um, what I want to do here is um, first do some mapping, which is really description. I'm going to pick a couple of topics or questions relating to gender that seem to be important. Uh, and I'm going to sort of say what the distribution of views are. Uh, people are very supportive, people are very opposed, uh, just what they look like. So this, this is going to be kind of descriptive, and I'll do it for two different kinds of things. One attitude toward gender equality, and one uh, Islamic prescriptions pertaining to women. And you'll see what those mean when, when I get to them in a minute. Then after you, I've done the two- Mark, if I can jump in, uh, yeah, sorry yeah. to interrupt you again. Can you make sure your display setting at the top uh, swaps out? So, so do the same thing you did at the beginning where you uh, choose display setting so we can see the bigger one um, um, to um, follow you better. I think I'm gonna mess it up. Yeah, I said that thing. That's uh, okay, we can I know, okay. fix it here. Sure. Uh, so. All right, let's put it back on this one, I think. So is that okay? I mean, I, that's okay? 
That looks good to me. Yeah. Okay, then I'll, I'll go to where we were before. Great. Uh, okay. So um, we're going to talk about each of these, and then I'm going to try to move to some extent uh, from mapping variance or description to accounting for variance or explanation. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means when I get there. <clears throat> okay. So here's a series of questions that were asked uh, in, uh, that have been asked. Uh, not everyone was asked in every survey, but most of them were asked in most of the surveys. And uh, this gives us kind of a picture of, uh, of, what, people, of what people think. It's, it's definitely an aggregate picture, an aggregate map. Uh, it can be, and I know that it is, uh, somewhat different in, in some countries. So not every country uh, lines up exactly this way. But taking the countries as a whole, uh, you can see where there's fairly equal division, uh, where there is uh, relatively less support for, uh, for gender equality. On the whole, men make better political leaders than women. Only 20%, 20, only, uh, 20 27% disagree. Most agree, yeah, men make better leaders. Um, and there have been some other interesting studies that uh, have investigated that. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, here, university education is more important for a boy than a girl. 70% or 71% say that. Uh, still a fair number that, that say, no, it's more important for a, bo a boy. But in terms of the distribution, it's very much skewed in the direction of, of equality. <clears throat> so um, we've combined some of these items, and there's a technique for doing that and for evaluating which items really deserve to be put together in a, in a single index. Um, and uh, so we have a kind of gender equality index. I'll come back to it in a little bit. I'm going to go on to the second dimension. Uh, so one mentioned one here is gender equality. People support it or they don't support it. And what do you mean by gender equality? Here's what we mean. Uh, second question is, um, uh, what does Islam say about women? It has to do with, with uh, inter interpret interpretations of religion. Uh, you'll see the questions in a minute. But I put this up to say that uh, it's in the context of uh, a lot of differing points of view from uh, scholars with different kinds of uh, training, different kinds of experience. Uh, at the most conservative end, you have people like Maududi and Saeed Qutb. He's, a, he's an Egyptian who studied in the US and found it uh, and just came to the conclusion the values here are just, are just terrible. Uh, you have uh, Karadawi, who was the, I think he still is, um, head of the, he's a spiritual leader of the, of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, the one whose uh, party we've talked about before. Uh, and he's, uh, he's, he's situated his, his prescriptions in an Islamic context. So we're in uh, a country that's governed by Islamic law. It's not a secular country. But in that country, women need to be educated. They need to be empowered. Uh, they need to be involved in society. Uh, and then you have people, Al-Tahawi uh, um, uh, uh, and Fatima uh, Merisi. She's Egyptian. She's Moroccan. She's passed away. Um, and uh, they're saying that, you know, uh, and this is a point of view that you hear a lot, it's not an uncommon point of view, uh, that, uh, you know, we, we've allowed people who have, uh, I don't know, a certain kind of mindset and a certain kind of bias against women to be the ones who tell us what Islam really says. We all see the Quran, we all see the Hadith, but someone's got to tell us that how do we decide which are the relevant, uh, the relevant passages? Uh, and what's the interpretation of that passage? Uh, and so these are examples of a, of a, um, a stream of, of, of argument that is fairly widespread. And so the question that we're interested in now is given that there's a range of views from a fairly traditional one, uh, and well, I'll leave it at that for the moment, uh, and a fairly liberal progressive one, uh, each of which has been articulated by people who make a strong case, uh, where do individuals come down on this? And so we've asked uh, a number of questions, and here's two of them. Uh, so the question begins with, uh, sorry, I'm just taking a drink of water. It starts off by telling respondents, okay, you can read it too. Today, as in the past, Muslim scholars and jurists sometimes disagree. I could have said, uh, very knowledgeable and, and highly respected uh, scholars and journalists sometimes disagree about the proper interpretation of Islam in response to present day issues. For each of the statements below, 
indicate whether you agree or disagree uh, with the interpretation that's presented. So there are two of these here. Uh, it's a violation of Islam for men and women or male and female university students to attend classes together. Um, again, these are 36 surveys over four waves, uh, 41,000 respondents. So it's a lot and it covers a wide range, but it may hide the fact that in some countries uh, the prescription is different. And uh, if one wanted to dig deeper uh, and you're interested in certain countries, well, you take a look at individual countries and either remove them or not remove them depending on uh, what the distributions look like. But with this, uh, for this aggregate map, uh, look how skewed it is toward the, the liberal end. Uh, this is uh, 60, 66 or 67 percent either disagree or disagree strongly. Uh, no, it's not a violation of Islam. Um, you know, and if you know somebody, you can ask that person and he or she may have their own opinion. But you can see there are some people who do agree that it's a violation and some people agree it's a serious violation. They strongly agree that, it, that it's a violation, uh, but they're clearly in the minority. A uh, second question, and this is the last one. <clears throat> in Islam, a woman should dress modestly, sure, but Islam does not require that she wear a hijab. Uh, this is a question that's also contested. Uh, and uh, I think if you get a representative group of, uh, of, of Muslim women, uh, you may get some debate among them on, on this. Maybe they're not gonna agree with one another. Anyway, it's the same kind of picture um, <clears throat> that, uh, 60 60 percent plus agree or strongly agree that uh yes hijab is not required uh i mean a woman should wear it if she feels comfortable with it if it uh gives her a feeling of, of closeness to her religion or something else by all means it's not pres prescribed uh but it is not required uh well there's uh, uh no i don't know of almost 40 percent that disagree but uh so there's there's division on both of these but the skew is toward the more quote unquote liberals time. If I combine these, uh, I get again an index from uh, eight to two, took a traditional, a liberal position on both items, took a very conservative position on both or somewhere in between. Uh, and so I'm gonna be playing around with the scale uh, to try to see, well, what would be, how would you explain this difference? I mean, who are these people that are at the liberal end down here? two and three and four, as opposed to six, uh, seven, six, seven, eight. Who are they? Are they are they mostly women? Are they mostly young women? Are they mostly young men? Are they mostly urban people? Uh, what is going on? What can we learn about the factors that shape people's attitudes uh, with respect to a, dis a distribution that is in fact quite spread out? Uh, and that brings us now uh, for uh, a couple of minutes to uh, to try and looking at some of those relationships. If you remember what I mentioned back here, um, it was, uh, first we're gonna take a look at some of the attitudes. We're gonna map that very, just see what the distributions look like. Now we're gonna see if we can do, a, uh, if we can make some predictions about who are the people at one end, or who are the people that are more supportive of gender equality as opposed to less using that scale that we had. Uh, okay, so, um, ah, okay, so now I'm back to gender equality. Uh, the Islamic interpretation will come in a little bit. Uh, so we're formulating some hypotheses. Uh, we wouldn't really need to do this for our presentation here, but just to kind of give you a sense of how we normally proceed uh, and what, uh, um, what analysis would look like. So, uh, so one thing we're asking ourselves is uh, how important is being, is being religious? Are people who are more devout less likely to support uh, gender equality? or not, or maybe they're more supportive. Um, and so we, we're kind of asking ourselves uh, some questions about what do we think are the factors that are gonna actually help to predict whether a person is at one end of the distribution or at another. Uh, that would, would refer to that as accounting for variance. We're kind of saying what that variance depends on. Uh, and we could just go in and try a bunch of things, try this, try that, and eventually maybe we'd find something. Uh, and I mean, sometimes people do that. Uh, but normally we try to think through uh, what, what is likely to really make a difference. What, what, what's something that probably does account for some of that variance? Uh, and we'd, we'd express that in terms of a hypothesis. Uh, and this is just an example of one. Uh, there's another one that I'd be interested in showing you as well if we get time. Uh, and so we're thinking about, uh, and we is not necessarily the Air Barometer Project as a whole. This is 
a group of us who are working on this, uh, and some of it's already been published. Um, so yeah, let's. I, I think uh, women, you know, religion uh, is it's it's pushing people away. Now we're talking about Islam. It's pushing people away from gender equality. Uh, those who are more religious are less likely. Why would that be the case? Well, we've said why we think it might be the case. Of course, these are just these are just educated guesses. We, we may find out when we get to the data that we're completely wrong, uh, but we've kind of made explicit what we think is going on. Uh, these people are uh, more likely to be influenced by religious co uh, codes, and uh, many of those codes are, uh, are are conservative. Well, but there's another possibility that maybe is equally persuasive, uh, and that is people who are uh, more religious are uh, not less likely to support gender equality. Uh, and that's because uh, they, they're being religious, they probably have studied the religion more. Uh, they're able to have a more nuanced uh, interpretation of what the religion requires. All of this is just speculation, uh, but it's a prelude to then going to the data and saying, does religion make a difference or not? As I said, we could skip this step, but uh, in research, it's really useful uh, to kind of have a sense of what you're looking for and why you're looking for it. Uh, and that tells you, it, and that sets up what you're going to do. Okay. Uh, all right. So here we are. Uh, so th these are all of those uh, those surveys together. Um, I'm going, to disag I'm going to do some what's called disaggregation over here on the other uh, to the right, but so far we're just looking at at, at all the all the relationships. So uh, there are five hypotheses. I only showed you one about religion, uh, and um, another one is interpersonal trust that uh, uh, we're uh, okay. Yeah, in, I, I highlighted the wrong one. The one should be highlighted. It should be up here. Uh, but we're going to see. So is there a, is it the fact that uh, people who are more personally religious, I know we can have a conversation about how to measure that as well, uh, and I can tell you kind of what we did, um, are they less likely to support gender equality? Do they have an inverse relationship? The more, the more religious you are, the less supportive of gender equality. Um, the answer to that so far is yes, uh, there is a significant relationship. Um, I, won't, I won't try to Kind of explain the logic of probability here. Probably most of you know it anyway. Uh, but uh, uh, so 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 that hypothesis that more re more religious people are less supportive of gender equality is um, uh, is, is confirmed. I put uh, hmm, I meant to put the word predict up here because uh, for us to really say that religion is a cause of opposition to gender equality, uh, we would need to do a lot more. I mean, this is. Uh, we don't have all kinds of controls, and so uh, I'm really just showing you the, the relationship. But religion does seem to have something to do with it. I meant to highlight this one here for interpersonal trust. This is political trust and something different. Uh, and what the finding is that uh, higher interpersonal trust, this is, this is a real puzzle. Maybe you'll have some ideas. Uh, the more like, the more, the, the higher the degree to which you trust ordinary citizens, that you remember those questions about uh, interpersonal trust, the more trusting you are of people like yourself, of ordinary citizens, the less supportive of gender equality you are. And we certainly, or I certainly would have thought it was the opposite, that if you're more trusting, then you, you're uh, more likely to support gender equality. But there is a strong relationship and it's exactly the opposite direction. So that's a puzzle that's worth thinking about. It also tells us uh, sort of how, the kinds of things that come out of research, things that we didn't expect and really require us to spend some time thinking, of, uh, thinking about what's the proper interpretation of these findings and then doing some other, some additional analysis to see if that interpretation holds up. Uh, but now I've done something else, uh, which makes the findings, uh, I think, more instructive. Uh, and uh, I divided all the respondents, or we divided all the respondents uh, in this study uh, on the basis of age, sex, and education. And I put them in eight categories, uh, men and women, younger, age 40, uh, 34 or under, less than primary, less than secondary education. Uh, so this is one category based on gender, based on age, based on education. 
so we have eight categories ranging from, and you, you can read what they are here, uh, down where I put the cursor, women aged 35 and older with less education, uh, less than secondary education. So these are older, these are the women, they're older, uh, and they're not especially well educated. Um, so what I did was to redo the analysis that we saw over here on the left for each of these categories. Uh, so um, here are the, and the, now we see interpersonal trust. So uh, does, does, the, does the, the relationship that was identified over here that more religious people are less supportive of gender equality. You might want to think further about what, why that's the case, but anyway, it does seem to be the case. Uh, is that true for uh, younger men who are less well-educated? Is it true for older men who are less well-educated? Uh, and we can see that of the eight categories here, there are only three in which the relationship that we saw over here is, is, is found. Uh, and so this relationship, although it's clear and pretty strong, uh, it actually describes what's going on in for certain demographic categories uh, and not the majority of them. And if you look at what those categories are, they are categories of uh, older, uh, older, uh, yeah, uh, old, older people who are less well educated, uh, more traditional. So here's uh, older women who are less well educated, significant. Here are older men who are less well-educated. And so we see, uh, we, we kind of get a picture now uh, that among younger people, um, and especially if they're educated, but maybe to some extent, even if they're not educated particularly well, uh, religion doesn't, does, not, uh, does not predispose them to have a negative view of gender equality. It's only among older people. And that's not necessarily very surprising, uh, but it kind of tells us that this relationship, which might be kind of interesting, uh, is really circumscribed. It, it, it applies to certain demographic categories, and that's worth knowing. Uh, but to many other, in fact, the larger number of demographic categories, it does not apply. Uh, here's the uh, high interpersonal trust. Uh, and we can see that uh, it's for, uh, it turns out it's mostly for men, uh, which is also something interesting. So it's mostly among men. There's one category among women, but uh, it's mostly among men, regardless of age and education, that uh, if you have a higher level of interpersonal trust, you're more trusting of other people, you are less supportive of gender equality. Um, I think that's a puzzle. And um, maybe you have some insights. Okay, I'm gonna just go a little bit more. So I wanna go back now to finish up with this, uh, uh, this question about Islamic interpretation. And I, I have some slides that I think I'm not going to get to that, that kind of test, uh, you know, religion and interpersonal trust and uh, economic circumstances and some of these other variables. If you want to ask about it in the q and I, I can probably put up a few, a few slides. But here I'm really just taking a look at, on that scale, if you remember we saw before, uh, from to the liberal end, using the word liberal in, in quotes, uh, uh, to eight at the more conservative, in quotes, uh, end. Um, what does it look like in, uh, in different countries? Um, in most of the countries, it's sort of what, uh, Jordan, Algeria, and Egypt. Uh, in Egypt, we didn't do wave, uh, wave one, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's uh, kind of like that, um, that distribution as a whole. Uh, the, the, the mean or, the, or the, well, the, yeah, the mean of the scale, we could do the median as well. Um, it's, uh, it's on the liberal side. So we would say for all these countries, I kind of put down a little summary of what we find for each one. Uh, if the midpoint is 5.5, um, the, the mean for these, for Jordan uh, and for all the waves in Jordan, uh, same thing for Algeria, same thing for Egypt, it is somewhat on the liberal side. Uh, and if we looked at the whole distribution, it would be kind of like the distribution as a whole, fairly spread out, but skewed toward a more liberal interpretation. Uh, the hijab is not required by Islam, and women, men and women can study together at universities. Uh, there's one country that's different, uh, and that's Tunisia, and this is skewed much more toward the liberal end. The, the, if the midpoint is 5.5, we've got the mid and high fours here, uh, now it's way down in the threes. 
and it's getting further and as we over time uh, it's becoming even more widespread uh, and so Tunisia stands out as a country in which uh, there is more support for gender equality and support for gender equality is in fact increasing over time um, so these are just again sort of some maps as I say I've got uh, some hypotheses about this and some relationships to take a look at I'll leave that let me mention what uh, what I'm not going to get to at all in case you want to ask about it um, had to do with people's attitudes toward democracy uh, and their commitment to democracy as an institution as a political system the degree, which, the degree to which they did or did not have the kinds of values I was talking about before, interpersonal trust, tolerance, support for gender equality, civic engagement, political knowledge, political interest. Uh, there's a well-known uh, profile, I guess, of it's kind of called the democratic culture. Uh, so I'm gonna look at some of those things and maybe you, you, you can feel free to ask about them. So I think I'm gonna stop here. Uh, it's five o'clock, which is kind of the time I'm supposed to stop.